If you're interested in fishing a smallmouth specific kayak tournament, you're in luck. The DMV Bronzeback Yak Challenge will start July 1st and run the whole month. The DMV Bronzeback Yak Challenge gives kayak anglers the opportunity to wrestle for bronzebacks right here in the DMV metropolitan area. The rules are though, you have to be a resident of the DMV or West Virginia. It's a catch photo release kayak tournament for smallmouth only from the Potomac River, Shenandoah River, Rappahannock tributaries that flow within DC, Maryland, VA, and West Virginia. Competitors must be a resident of the DMV or the West Virginia area. If you're interested, anglers should join the DMV Bronzeback Yak Challenge Facebook page, which will be the first link in the episode description. The tournament starts July 1st. Again, if you're interested in joining this tournament, Go to Facebook, DMV Bronzeback Yak Challenge Facebook page. Download a membership form. We'll see you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have the guy that kicked some butt in the, the NVKBA tournament, the Three Rivers Bronzeback Challenge, I believe. And guys, you can in the comment section if I got that uh, name wrong a little bit. But uh, last year, he kicked him on the Potomac. And then this year, he did it again. A- and honestly, your legend is growing as the Upper Potomac. Like, just you cast checks on this part of the river. And I love to kind of know the story behind the person and, and, and their upbringing. And you have an interesting story to go along with that because you've been here your whole life. So you've gotten to see the Upper Potomac through its ups and its downs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've got so many things to talk about. So, sir, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. No, it's, it's a pleasure. So how, like, tell, tell your story. Like, How did you get started into fishing? Like, For me, it was my mom that kind of got me into it. And we would go down to Walney Pond, places like that in Vienna, Virginia. And we got I got hooked on it. And actually, there was this drainage ditch by the Wendy's in, um, in Vienna. And we used to catch bass and stuff out of that thing. Like, mm-hmm. How did you get your start? I think my dad got me started by accident, I think. I, think, I remember we were in Texas, I think. And we were in a, uh, I think it was like a... Uh, it seemed like it was a, in, we were inside a building. We we're fishing in a building. It must have been like a fish factory or like a fish, like a farm, like a pond. Yeah, uh, a fish, a fish farm pond or something. And uh, and I grew up next to Pennant Run in McLean. And um, so as a you know as a seven year old kid, I asked my mom to give me a fishing rod to fish in our creek. And it started with creek chubs and eels, you know, with bread balls. Um, and then um, as I grew older. Uh, I met some friends in high school that were into smallmouth fishing and bass fishing. Uh, I was like, you know, what's that? You know, what's a smallmouth? And uh, we would go wading uh, in the lower Potomac uh, by Turkey Run Park, which is below the American Legion Bridge. And I'd spend my entire summer just wading that river. Um, it was shallow enough where you can actually go from the Virginia side to the Maryland side. Um, and just a bunch of, you know, small islands and boulders. And so that's how I started smallmouth fishing. Yeah, that, that section was really famous for me because or it was really impressionable because we had an old aluminum tracker. <clears throat> it was so old that it was a riveted al- tracker. It wasn't the <laughs> welded type. And uh, we had a little outboard on it. And so we used to go across to White's Ferry, which uh, if people don't know, like that used to be open. I think they're still in litigation, I believe. At yeah, this I think point. they're, yeah. Huge issue. But we would go from Leesburg across, dump in, and we could run that whole section because it, it was deep enough around there to run it. Mm-hmm. Um and that was very impressionable to my fishing career because that really got me out there and I learned to chase smallmouth and I, I, I fell in love. I was hooked. And it's crazy because that part of the Potomac comes through a major metropolitan area. It's so close to DC. Leesburg is huge now. Yeah. And I feel like people forget like there's some damn good fishing right there in Northern Virginia for smallmouth. Yeah. It, it's, it's gotten better. I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I started waiting and, you know, then I bought a canoe um, and that got tiresome, you know, we, to, you know, rowing a canoe up, up, uh, up the Potomac. And I, you know, went and bought a jet boat and I had that for about three years. Um, and then I actually quit fishing. Uh, I just got, it was just, I, know, I guess, got tired of it and uh, started playing golf. <laughs> and, a, and a friend of mine, uh said hey you should th- think about kayak fishing i'm like kayak fishing what's that 
Uh, and I'm thinking that, you know, those little small kayaks that you see those guys in, you know, the Great Falls riding down. Uh, and I, my first kayak was an old town predator. Um, and, uh, I fell back in love with it and, you know, found a bunch of people on Facebook and, you know, competing in the tournaments and started my own league, um, ran it for about three years for smallmouth fishing only. Why did you get out of it? I mean, was it just, it, it, you you basically toppled every goal that you had. You had no more goals, or no, it just, just it maybe? was just you know. I mean, when you have a jet boat, just it's like oh my god, it was like you know the, the maintenance of the boat and you know you know trailing it to your to, to your waters and it just yeah. got to got to be a pain. I, I just and I found other interests. Um, I only was out of fishing for about maybe I don't know maybe four years, five years. Uh, so I just completely stopped and then. When I was introduced to kayak fishing, uh, I was like, wow, this is awesome. What was the, um, what was the fishing like in those years that you quit? Was it like on a downturn or an uptick? Um, it was, it was okay. I mean, most, cause most of the, the where I fished, a lot of it was, just, it was just so much easier to, uh, access by just waiting. Okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, the canoe helped, you know, we, we were reached my buddies and I would reach spots that, uh, you know, further up river with the canoe and it, it was, it was good. It was, it wasn't that bad at all. Um, but you know, when I got the kayak, you know, I obviously I'm, I'm hitting a lot more areas than I would with the canoe, even with the jet boat, um, where I fish and, um, the, 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 the fish that I'm catching, I'm catching bigger fish with my kayak. Um, and, I guess it's time on the water. I, 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 you know, I know all the spots that I need to hit, but, um, the quality of the fish, I mean, they, these are, you know, this year I've been out maybe six times and I've caught a 19 inch every time. Um, what is the timeline for that when you got your kayak? Because, um, the, the Shenandoah river, of course, you know, is the major tributary to the Potomac and we right. have this massive fish kill. So I'm trying to get a timeline in my head, like, Though the Potomac, it didn't seem to suffer the same as Shenandoah did for all those years. Yeah, I don't think it, you know, when, when we had those big rains, I mean, what was that, 2018? Yeah, 2017. 18, 17. I, I'm thinking like a lot of those big fish in the Shenandoah were just, they, moved they, just were, they just moved down to the Potomac. I mean, I, you know, and t when I first got my kayak fishing the Potomac, the biggest fish I would catch was maybe a, a, a just maybe just an eighteen incher, uh, and every year it's, they've been getting. Maybe the fish are growing too, but uh, wow. the uh, I'm catching a lot of nineteens now. Um, wow. Yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty fun. And it's a huge shout out to the Maryland DWR. I mean, they've been doing fantastic work. I recently on my on my little vacation, I was listening to the John Mulliken, uh episode when he's the main guy that runs the Potomac river and the fish hatchery program. And they're trying every year to, to stock 35,000, 30 to 35,000 oh, you know, wow. smallmouth in the river. And it's fun to look at those tournament histories. And, um, I, I think we talked about this a little bit when I was helping to MC the, uh, the kayak tournament results, but it was like 21 to 22 pounds last year. And it was like 20 pounds this year mm -hmm. on the upper Potomac for those tournaments. And so, yeah. That's damn good weights this close to Washington, D.C. for smallmouth. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, yeah, the, the, the fish are healthy. Um, you know, what I noticed this year, you know, at the, well, last week when we fished, uh, the grass is starting to grow again upriver. Um, there's some patches of grass that was good. So now you also, you kind of hinted at it earlier, you have a banging logo for a club that you created. Yeah. What is the history behind that? So, you know, you know, because of my work, I, it's, it's hard for me to, it was hard back then to fish on weekends. So, uh, you know, I, I fished a couple of the KBF month long events. So I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to create a, my own league and, and have a month long smallmouth only event. Uh, so we ran that, I think my first year was 2016. Um, it was just easier for me, you know, I fish weekday mornings. That's the, that's, you know, for me, that's the best days to fish. Um, so it allowed me to compete in tournaments, which I like to do, uh, without having to, you know, worry about, <clears throat> you know, not being able to fish on a weekend. Uh, so yeah, so the logo, you know, I'm wearing the hat right now. I'm not sure if you can see it. 
yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's but uh, it cost me like 10, 15 bucks to make. Um, I went online. There's a there there's a free, there's freelance graphic artists who who will do the work. You just tell them what to do. Um, and I think I went back and forth with the, with the artist maybe you know a dozen times, and he created exactly the image that I wanted uh, for our logo. So um, our Facebook page still exists, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's DMV Bronze Back Yak Challenge. But we haven't been active you know for about three years now. And from there, w when did you get hooked up with the Potomac River Smallmouth Club? Because I remember back when I lived in Vienna, like I, I knew about them. Like they've been here for a long time. Yeah, they've been here a long time. So I started first going to the meetings uh, right after college in 1990, 1991. Uh, and they were in the Wildlife Federation building uh, off of Leesburg Pike. Uh, and there's a church there now. I forget what the name of the church is, but. Um, so the meetings back then, there were, I mean, it was a hundred people plus every, it was, I think it was every, the last Friday of every month or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, over time, you know, they just stopped, you know, they didn't really push uh, new membership. And this is the first year that actually disbanded the meetings. They'd have, they would have speakers every month, uh, you know, great speakers, live speakers coming on, uh, to the meetings and, um, this year they're actually disbanded. I'm in I'm in charge of their Facebook page, so I, I I'll occasionally you know post things about smallmouth and some of the catches that I that I've made. But um, right now they're meeting casually uh, at the Vienna Inn uh, at the end of every month. I really I hope they can try to evolve. It, it would really be a shame with all that history and legacy for it to disappear. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're they're a bunch of good guys, and that was just the, the club just got older, and you know. You know, young guys these days can just log into YouTube and find their information without having to go to a meeting. So, yeah. And if you don't have the camaraderie and you're just basically just information, that's a problem. And yeah. I think what New Horizon did so well is they built community. New Horizon, yeah. Bass Anglers, they're, they're a club that I've been affiliated with since I was since I didn't even have a boat. I would go to those meetings um, because, I mean, you need that to be able to get like minded anglers in this area because there's so few places to fish. I mean. I think we, we talked off air a little bit about like, like Beaver Dam Reservoir and like that place, dude, when I was a kid, that thing was banging. And then all of a yeah. sudden it's like, they're locking it up, locking key and you can't really do anything. It's like, is this going to be Lake Manassas 2.0 or something? Yeah, it was actually, you know, a buddy of mine would, went, you know, would fish there regularly right before they closed. So this year uh, they're, they're renovating the lake to make it a more of a community. They're going to have a boat ramp. They're going to have a, boat rentals and it's going to totally destroy the the, the fishing there but it, it 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 has some big large mouth um I, I was regularly catching five six pounders um and and you're right back way back you know when i was in high school we used to go there and i think they had tiger muskie in there at one point yeah yeah they did i heard yeah. that rumor too yeah and, and then i fished um goose creek honestly too we used to float that thing all the time mm. And um, we would have like our parents pick us up at the highway drop off so we could get into the lake. Yeah. It has some smallmouth in it too. Yeah, that, I think some actually uh, one of the anglers that I, when I went fishing there, he actually caught a smallmouth, like a five pounder. Uh, really? Yeah, he caught he put a real nice one. Showed me a picture of it. Did you ever fish Goose Creek up below the dam? Like the golf course before they renovated it all back in the day, you could park and actually get to Goose Creek right there. Uh, no, I never went that I've never fished there. I fished n not that far up. So, um, Seneca breaks is as far as I've, I've really gone, um, from where I ramp from where I launched. I've, I've taken a couple of floats from Algonquin to, to river bend. Uh, okay. and that's a fun float. You can float it a hundred different ways because all the different islands that are in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it's a great float. Uh, you got to get it in the right time. I think, I think the summertime when the water is low, it's tough because, uh, there's stretches there where it's like six inches and it's hard to get through with a, with a kayak. But, uh, I always check the water, the levels. If little falls is at three, two to three, five, three, nine, uh, that's a perfect level for a float. What has been the biggest changes you've seen in the river then over the years? Like for the, for the positive, I guess first. Um, God, I don't know. The, the bald eagles, they're, all, you know, yes. I, I, yeah, I kind of wonder, you know, how much the, the predation of the bald eagles on the smallmouth, you know, will affect 
the population. Um, let, when we fish the tournament on Saturday, uh, some days you see, I mean, the, the bird, like the cormorants and the blue herons, there were tons of them out there. Hmm. Uh, and when I see them uh, along the river, you know, I know that the fishing is going to be really good. Uh, but there's an eagle nest where I fish. There's a every, I think there's three eagle nests that I pass. What well, the breeding eagles that are that are uh, in the river, uh, and that's just the Virginia side where I fish. You know, one of the islands cuts through. There's a there's a the river splits on the Maryland side, yeah. um, and I know there are nesting pair of eagles there too. Um, I found an eagle. Uh, I found a smallmouth ahead of a smallmouth that had to have been a remnant of a of an eagle. Uh, Eagles lunch or dinner, and this smallmouth had to have been twenty-one plus inches. It was huge, uh, and the head was just—it was just on the bottom of the, you know, the river. I actually have a video, and I have a in my one of my, I, I upload some videos on my on a YouTube page, but it it was it was huge. I never even would have thought of that, especially when that river gets really shallow and clear like that. Yeah, yeah an eagle would have no problem picking off whatever it wanted. Oh, like anything. That. I mean. Yeah, the, the the stretch of the river where I fish, there are pools that are maybe five feet, you know, six feet, but the majority of it is, you know, three feet or less. And um, and I know I got some comments about this before, and just to basically articulate to everyone, when we say the Upper Potomac, you have the tidal portion, which is from the falls down, and then what we consider really, I guess, the the prime upper is really from Great Falls to about the split where Harper's Ferry and the Shenandoah. Mm -hmm. and so just to make sure people are aware of this, that are listening on Apple and iHeart, I believe that we're talking about the section between Harper's Ferry and the falls. Yeah, uh, correct. Yeah. So just to make sure I, I cut, get ahead of that in the comment section below. Um, flatheads. I, uh, Jeff Green, uh, who Sh Shallow Water Adventures, he comes on the show to do a monthly fishing report. He is seeing an uptick in the catch of flatheads. Are, are you seeing any flatheads on the river when you're? I haven't seen any. No, I, you know, I'll catch, I'll catch an occasional channel cat, but, but I haven't seen any flatheads. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So weird how that, that is like some people catch a bunch of them and some people don't, but yeah, you're seeing more of them in there. And so I'm just interested to see how that affects that portion of the river. But it honestly, knock on wood, it doesn't seem like to be bothering them too much because of the size that you're actually catching out of there, which yeah. is which pretty, pretty awesome to see that it hasn't affected it negatively yet. Right. Well, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how, how much water they need. So the, the, like I said, it's not that deep where I'm fishing. So I'm not sure if flat need bigger pools or not, or if they need deeper water, but, um, yeah, why don't you fish deeper pools? Why don't I fish deeper pools? I, I they don't they don't exist where I fish. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. It's just it's just you know it's relative. The average depth is probably you know four feet, five feet, and there there are some pools that I know that you know maybe get seven or eight feet, but they're not very big. You mentioned on the the wrap up show for the the third Northern Virginia Kayak Association tournament that you like to fish fast. Has that always been your state of mind when competing for smallmouth yeah, or have always. you evolved your approach? Yeah. It, especially with the water staying as it was when we fished, when, when the water gets clear, you can see the fish are a little more finicky. The big ones are. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hitting my spots, you know, two or three casts. If I don't get a hit, I'm, I'm moving out of it. Uh, yeah. So it's Is that fast. Is that time of year dependent at all? Because we are in the warmer months. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. I mean, pre-spawn, post-spawn, you know, I'm, I'm fishing fast. In the summertime when, when the, you know, I'll slow down a little bit. You know, my, my, my go-to bait, uh, I always have a fluke tied onto my, on one of my rods. Mm. Um, and uh, the, I think the forage for the smallmouth in the Potomac are primarily the, the crate, the, for the big smallmouth of the crayfish uh and uh the um yamamoto uh hula grub uh is a perfect size and that that bait is i mean that's always on my rod as well when did you get on the chatterbait deal did you get on that immediately or when did you like oh this is the shit <laughs> yeah well, you know so i so i started switching swim jigs um so you know the swim jig was is my go is my go-to bait really? now and the chatterbait is not much different. And I, with, with the water, that, when it's stained, you know, it's a little more vibrate, vibration, uh, I think, attracts the, the smallmouth. And 
Yeah, when I caught, when you catch a chatterbait smallmouth, I mean, it just wants to crush it. It doesn't. It, it's immediate, and uh, and it's not. I don't miss many fish on a chatterbait because it's just they're so aggressive. Uh, the big ones are, and um, yeah, it's 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 a no brainer for me to have that on a, a rod. How do you like to rig it? What is your setup? Are you using? I'm assuming a baitcaster setup. Baitcaster, uh, 15 pound straight braid. Uh, and I trail it with a Yamamoto double tail uh, grub. Okay. Yeah. Half ounce? Uh, no, not that heavy. Uh, three, eight, three, was it three eighths? Is it? I don't know. Three. It's, yeah. It's not, sometimes I go with just under, under half an ounce. So it's not that, not that heavy. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're not going with like the stereotypical tidal Potomac one, which is important. So right. my guys that fish out of like Mata woman and Lusavania go with that lighter chatter bait. If you're going to be going up, because yeah. again, like you said earlier, you're not dealing with like eight to 10 feet. No, it's no. Yeah. It's, it's shallow water. How did you a swim jig and smallmouth? I would have never won that in a bingo match. I never would have <laughs> thought that those two go together. How did, how did that happen? It's weird how it, I mean, I just, it was just that the profile of the bait, I mean, you know, big, I wanted to catch big smallmouth. And so when, when we were in high school, a buddy of mine would fish a lunker lure, um, top water, lunker lure, any of the, the, you know, the, the bait, uh, buzz bait. Okay. And he, we would, he would just crush them, the big smallmouth on a buzz bait. So the size is, I mean, the smallmouth, you know, you, I fish almost the same baits I would with a large mouth, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's a perfect bait. I mean, I like it because I can fish every part of the water column with it. So if I need to slow down, I can jig it. Um, but when I fish it primarily, it's just cast and it's a very slow retrieve. And sometimes I'll pump it, I'll stop the retrieve, but it's it's a very steady retrieve. That's so crazy because like I, I preach that all the time that I think the swim jig is like the Swiss army knife for the fishing. Oh, yeah. Many things with. But I, I, for, I completely spaced on like, yeah, why wouldn't a smallmouth hit that thing? That makes so much sense. But you, you, you get in your, your, your mindset and you're not willing to just be open to ideas. Like a smallmouth might hit this too. Like you have to throw certain baits on the tidal Potomac because mm -hmm. it's power fishing. But then guys win $100,000 on a shaky head and a drop shot, which completely bucks the trend. And, yeah. and it's just so interesting learning those kind of tidbits like that. Yeah. Um, Half ounce, or are you going much lighter, of course, with the swim jig like the chatterbait, too? Yeah, a little bit lighter. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, tr I the, it's the, uh, again, it's not, you're not fishing deep water at all. Uh, and if the water's stained, I'll, I'll throw my chatterbait more. Uh, but, you know, white chartreuse, the, my, my go to colors are white and chartreuse. It doesn't matter what the, the, the stain of the water. Um, uh, I don't use black very often. It's just you know, white seems, it doesn't matter. They, they hit my white baits, uh, regardless of what the, the, the quality of the water is, or the, the stain in the water. Do you ever use a stinger hook with your chatterbait or your swim jig? Like the swim jig, especially. I mean, you're definitely asking for a 15 inch plus size smallmouth if you are fishing that bait, I'm assuming, because it's going to be hard for dinkies to to get buttoned up right yeah occasionally I'll, I'll throw a spinner bait and I'll, I'll do i'll put one on a spinner bait but not on a i don't put it on a chatter bait it affects i think it affects the reaction. the action um but uh on a spinner bait i will okay yeah the spinner bait's coming back too like I yeah i mean it's, it's it's you know the sp some type some days they'll crush the spinner bait um in the summertime you know the top water is my favorite uh so uh, you know I, i'll nose rig a fluke uh and i fish that a little, you know, I'll fish a little slow with the top water. Um, but if you want to have fun, you know, get a buzz bait out. I, I mean, the big, get a big buzz bait out. And even the small, small mouth will, will go after that. Uh, Did you ever get on the whopper plopper craze? You know, I, I have a couple. I don't have much luck with that for some reason. Um, I had a lot of luck with the tor baby torpedo. So, yeah. so when, so when I first started fishing, the, the baits, for, and this is like, you know, 1992, like in the 90s, I'm aging myself. Um, the the go-to bait was for smallmouth was the Bill Norman Baby N um, crankbait and baby torpedoes and tiny torpedoes. 
so those are the baits that my buddies and uh, the Rapala count, countdown. Uh, so those are the baits that we had, and it wasn't plastic baits for smallmouth. It was all, you know, these minnow style baits. And then, um, uh, you know, now I'm using, you know, spinner baits, just, you know, bigger baits to catch the bigger fish. I dude, that is such a blast from the past when you mentioned the torpedo, because I remember fishing one of these, at, I think it was like Lake Fairfax. These, yeah. these baby torpedoes i oh my gosh and they still catch fish it's like the oh. um oh the jit not the jitterbug um the J is it called the june bug the uh the top water bait La ladybug yeah it's i don't know what you're talking about yeah. yeah you know what i'm talking about but yeah. that used to be like the thing to throw at night if you were throwing yeah. if you're fishing at night that was the bait to throw mm -hmm. and i feel like a lot of these baits what ends up happening is it's just marketing like the idea yeah. of the mag draft like there has always been line through swim baits in California, but it wasn't until mega bass made it sexy and, and marketable that it became big. But yeah. these other baits will still like spinner bait. Spinner bait has not been a, a big draw on the big circuits for a while, but they do still catch fish. Yeah. They still catch fish. The, the baby torpedo will still catch fish. You just, it's just fun, you know, trying different things as you, you know, um, I still have a bunch of baby torpedoes that, that I'll tie on occasionally, but, uh, yeah, all those baits will still catch fish. Like a buzz bait too. Like now, do you go with a single blade or do you go with double for smallmouth? It's the I, I the the lunker lure, and it has a, the, I think it's a triple a triple blade on it or something. I mean, okay. it's a pretty big prop. Um, and uh, I've been I've been when I fish with that, I I trail it with a with a Kitek, uh, just to give it a bigger profile and a target for it to hit uh for the bass to hit but um yeah it's all that all those baits work oh, dude, I, I gotta really i gotta really start thinking about throwing those again what do you ever branch off the potomac river at all like is there any places that you've hit around northern virginia uh I, i've you know a couple of well the first couple of years that nvkb had determined the, the potomac was blown out so i i, I i'd go to the shenandoah but it was cold turkey. I mean, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was fishing. And a couple of years, I, I just didn't catch any fish. I, I, but uh, I've been to, um, obviously, the Susquehanna. Uh, when I had my jet boat, I would go there. And, cool. you know, this was, you know, mid-90s. I mean, 100 fish a day, you know, four hours of fishing. It was amazing. I mean, was my buddy, we would, just, we would just, you know, we would go there and on a Saturday night you know, fish on a Sunday, uh, just, you know, randomly pick a, pick a ramp. And there's one section we fished. It was probably about 200 yards. I, I forget where it was. We just, I would just fire the, 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 my, my boat up. We'd float down about 200 yards. Keep, just keep firing. We caught like a hundred fish in, in like three hours. It was awesome. Um, but, uh, what, what's cool. At, and actually at a smallmouth meeting, I won a guided trip to the new river and it's the only time I ever been there. This was 1993, and that's when the, the, the guide said, "This is the new bait," and it was a fluke. So he he introduced me to the fluke, and I was like, "Wow, what is this?" And we caught probably like 30 bass, nothing big, but we caught a lot of fish. And and I never saw that type of fishing. I was just used to crankbaits and torpedoes. Uh, and you know that after that trip, I bought like 30 packs of Zoom flukes. And, you know, ever since then, I've, I've had that on my rod. The fluke has, has to be one of the top baits that changed everything. Back when they had, like, the sluggo and the ability to have yeah. that soft jerk bait. It was, like, one of the first baits I really learned how to fish, fishing farm ponds. Mm -hmm. Because you could fish it anywhere over everything, and you could just catch them. Yeah. Period. It, it just, I mean, if you rig it, any way you rig it, it's just it's just an awesome. I mean, if, if I was a fish, I'd go after it, but. It's amazing how the action that it has for such a simple bait. How do you rig it? Because I know a lot of people have trouble with it where because usually they hit it on slack right. and with a you know regular jerk bait with the treble hooks, it's pretty easy. They just come button. But when you're dealing with a weedless format or just nose hook, do you do anything different to make sure you can you well, can hook up? I, I so tactical bassing had had a you know they showed how you can put a an owner CPI spring in the nose of the hook or the nose of the, of the bait. Actually, I actually have one here. Um, I've got one right here. So it's a spring. Where do I have it here? 
I should go full. It. Where's my camera? Go full screen. Nice. It's a oh, spring wow. that you put in the nose of the hook or nose of the bait. And um, so I like to get an angle right here. To, Perfect. To nose hook it. And so you glue the, the spring in the, in the nose. And then I have an owner wacky rig hook that I use. Um, but uh, yeah, that the action of that bait is awesome. And you can fish that slow or fast. And I just think that the, the hookups, because of the way this, I think the bass will attack the nose of the, the fish. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty good hookup ratio. That almost reminds me of, this is an oldie, the banjo minnow. Yeah. I mean, the same concept. I mean, yeah, it's the same concept. I think I'm going to date all the audience members that <laughs> know what I'm talking about. I know how old you are, but yeah, I, I remember, uh, was it babe Winkleson talking about that thing and yeah. it is the same concept, but it, it does work. Um, no, that's, that's a really good tip guys. Make sure you, you kind of like put that into your entry. Cause yeah, I have so many kids asking me like, how do I catch smallmouth? The soft jerk bait is absolutely one of my top picks to teach kids, but I think that format nose hooking it will be way better for young anglers to get the hookup ratio compared to just doing it a weedless style. Right. hundred percent. Now you do have some other rods back there. Uh, yeah. would you be interested in sharing some of the stuff that you got on there? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I got way too much stuff. <laughs> That's not, you can never have too much stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got, you know, I've got a collection of rods that I use for smallmouth and, and largemouth. Um, I'm actually going to fish tomorrow with a buddy. I'm not going to, I'm going to be in his boat, but, uh, um, yeah, I just, you know, I'm a Shimano guy and, uh, uh, I love, uh, St. Croix rods and Dobbins rods. So I've got a pretty good collection of those rods. What's your favorite setup that's behind you right now? Um, actually my favorite setup, which I don't make, uh, let me see. So G Loomis used to make a bunch of rods uh, called the bronze back rods. Wow. I don't know. Can you see it or not? But yeah. Yes, I can. So they don't make this rod anymore. And uh, I, I, it's, it's my favorite smallmouth rod. And I got a, I got a Shimano DC uh, Corrado on it. I like that. Is that a War Eagle spinnerbait? Yep. <laughs> there is. Dude, that is beautiful. That is absolutely the best spinnerbait on the market too. Yeah, yeah. These these will crush on the dude. The bronze back series. That is that is. Yeah, they, they, they don't make that anymore. And um, I used to have four of them. And uh, oh no, <laughs> my first my first <laughs> kayak trip, uh, I actually uh, flipped over and I lost two of my bronze back rod. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, man. it was pretty. Actually, it was weird. Not weird, but um, I was catching fish that day and I wasn't paying attention. Uh, my kayak. You know, when you're not paying attention, you're floating 50 yards down river. And I got too close to a tree and a, and a boulder. Uh, I flipped over the kayak, lost two of my uh, rods. I lost my keys. I lo actually, everything came out of the kayak. Um, <laughs> but it was a section of the river where I knew. And, and at the time, it was, it was, it was in the early spring, so it was, the water was pretty high. I went back four weeks later. Um, I found my keys. I found all my tackle boxes. They're in the same spot. Uh, but my, my two rods that I'm looking for, I couldn't find. Oh, yeah. Probably someone took those. Yeah. Well, either, that's... I mean, they just were, there was light and they just, you know, went down river somewhere, but I was lucky to find my keys. I found like, you know, pretty important. Keys. important. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, now you said you had an, uh, an old town, your first kayak, right? Is that the one that you're using now that you've had your success? No, so with? I, this is my third river kayak that I'm, I'm I have a bona fide RVR now. Ooh. Um, yeah. So my first one was the old town, uh, the, the MX, which was the, the short one. Uh, my second was a bona fide SS 107, which I loved. Um, I thought it was a little bit light. I mean, the kayak was, it, it really, it paddles well in the, in the river. Um, it was getting beat up just because of what, you know, where I fish. And then, uh, I decided to get the RBR and that, that thing is awesome. Um, I got an 1103 torpedo on it and, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome on the river. How far of range do you get with that torpedo? Do you ever have an issue with battery life? No, I, I, I carry like for, like when I'm competing, I'll, I'll carry two of the bigger batteries. And so when I ran it in the tournament, I had about 20% left. 
because I was just I was gunning it pretty good when you know up river. Um, so no, I mean it, it'll last a you know one battery will last a full day of fishing. If I fish, I mean full day meaning if I fish twelve hours, I'd be, I'd be fine. I'm debating about getting the RVR or I guess there's a, a local company that makes some kind of inflatable. I think it's the Osprey. Yeah. Well, um, the innovative sportsman with, yeah. That yeah. That, that's a pretty sweet thing that he has. Um, plus like, he's local. Yeah. He's, he, he's local too. And he, he's a great guy. I mean, if you need to get your kayak rigged up with a motor, he's the guy to go to. Um, really? He actually, I, my, my bone. So my bona fide SS one Oh seven, was the first uh, he rigged up. Um, he needed it for free because he wanted to see if his plates would work on my kayak. So Jeff Little actually hooked him up and hooked me up with him. And um, he's up in, up, you know, in, up past Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is not too far for me. And um, yeah, really good guy. Has has the closure of, of White's hurt at all? Because I guess I probably should have asked this first. Are you on the Maryland side or the Virginia side? Virginia side. Okay, so that helps with this next part. So because of the whole thing with with White's Ferry, has that affected your ability to fish at all? Or did you never really use White's Ferry at all? To be yeah, and I've, I've fished there maybe twice. You know, it's still too far up for me to go up there. But I don't think it, I don't think, you can still take your boat and launch it off the White's Ferry, I think the Maryland side, I think. I'm not sure. If yes. The- yeah, you can. It was more of like if you were on the Virginia side, it's you'd have to go the long way. Now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. If you if if you wanted to, yeah, because you have to go, you know, around the Beltway. But um, the uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's different. The fishing is different there. I mean, it's just it's just wider. It's more wide open, I think, over there. It is. Um, you got to find. You have to know where the ledges are there. Um, where I fish, I mean, I'm in the lower part of the Potomac, and it's just so much. The island, the scrub islands, and the, you know, it's it's just everything's visual. You you just you can see everything that where you where you need to hit. Now you like to fish the lower part, but it sounds like you were around when the Dickerson power plant was a thing. And did you ever get to experience that? No, I, I yeah, I I always heard that the, in the winter time, yeah. that's where all the big ones were were going. Um, I never got a chance to go, but yeah, uh, I read all the books. I have the, I think Penrod's book that talked about Dickerson. When I had Charlie Taylor on, he talked about that. Like, yeah, in the winter time, I mean, it, you could get up there and it was insane how the fish used to stack up there. Yeah. It's like, I was too young and I really wish I got to experience like what that was kind of like. Yeah. It, it, it was pretty awesome. I heard. Yeah. Now, a- as you get lower into the river, when you get down to that section, um, Jeff green usually is operating above really the sections that, that you're at. You're oh. talking, Rip, you're talking shallow riffles, you know, a little bit faster moving water. Um, when, when you get down into your section, is it kind of the same thing or does it get into deeper pools below where you fish? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's below Seneca breaks is where I fish. So um, that area of the, of the river, um, again, it's, 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 it's finding that, I mean, there are deeper pools, you know, where, the, where, where there are, um, where there are islands and boulders and, um, yeah, it's 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 moving water. The, the big fish like to 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 reside in. The, it's you know it's pretty basic smallmouth. You know in the slack water, uh, you know next to moving water. And uh, for the people that are not from Northern Virginia, could you describe what Seneca Breaks is specifically? It's just a <laughs> it's a it's a big area, rapid area of moving water. It's just yeah, I mean it's a it's uh it's I think it's right below. Algonquian, um, you can when you float it, um, it you, you got to float it when, when the when you can when the water levels at a good level. But it's uh, yeah, it's just I mean, the fish pre spawn will, will migrate up there, I think, and feed because uh, of the because of the water that, that's there. Um, it's pretty it's, it's about five, maybe six feet, seven feet deep in that area. And it's above Great Falls. And so it's above Great Falls, right. Right below it's right below um what's the golf course? Trump, I guess Al- Algonquian. And then yeah. yeah. And so just for people at, at home that are listening, they're not from the area. So Seneca breaks and Sen- and the Great Falls are, are completely two different things. Um yeah. that's not like that's not like some kind of nickname that's completely separate. Yeah. Great Falls is way below the point. Way below. 
Mountains. Uh, in Algonquian Park, for some people, it's actually a deeper area where people can launch boats or some people try, depending on the time of year. Yeah. But um, so if you're new to the area, because I know Ashburn is insanely growing with new people that come into town here and aren't familiar with this stuff. So this is important just for safety, uh, you know, with the breaks in Algonquian Park to understand the areas and where you're trying to fish and depending on what you can fish it's just important to kind of know. So just wanted to put a little bit of a bow in that. Cause I think that's important for people um, that listen to this and then constantly ask me about where can I put in a boat? Where can I kayak? What's to be safe? Because yeah, I, I don't want you guys going over the falls or, or anything like yeah. that. <laughs> what um, you've been in this area so long. We talked about Beaver, Beaver Dam Reservoir and, and that whole thing. Did you ever get to experience like Lake Manassas or any other kind of bodies of water in the Northern Virginia area? Have you no, seen the yeah, not no, not not Lake Manassas. So Burke Lake was, you know, was a place that I would go a lot in the summertime. Um, you know, it's amazing how much pressure that place gets, but people still catch fish. Um, but, I don't know how. Yeah, I don't know how either. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Beaver Dam, I mean, that's what they're going to turn it into. They're going to turn it into a community. Uh, you know, so actually, two years ago, a, a paddleboard dot drowned in Beaver Dam um uh, so apparently somebody drowned in lake anna this weekend today oh, yeah yeah and can't stay park. and it's uh, it's the same reason this this girl didn't have a you know a life vest um and beaver dam gets it it's it gets this crosswind that that shoots right down the the lake and she was on a paddleboard and it gets really bad windy out there too and she must have been out too far out and just fell off her board but um Anyway, uh, yeah, they're gonna they're making Beaver Dam into. I think it's gonna probably open up later this year. But um, the uh, they're they're gonna be boat rentals there, and you know, will you be allowed to like launch a boat in your kayak, or is that? Yeah, you, you can still fish it. It's just gonna be crowded with paddle boarders and you know, a bunch of kids <laughs> and they're and they're. And, and that's something that's frustrating. And I hope that they don't do this reactionary stuff to when there is a tragedy and they start doing this because. It, no matter what rules you put on the books, it's common sense has to like prevail. And yes. you know, you, you can't, you can't like stop people from, cause I know that's a big issue with Sleater's Lake. You know, the one time I went there, they have like, you have to write down your name and all the information so they can check on you. And like, by the way, they only have so many parking spots. So if you don't get there in time on a busy day, you're not allowed to launch your kayak oh, and wow. they treat it they treat it more like a public swimming pool than they do like a park, a outdoor park. And that's a little scary because it's like, I don't know. You're, you're losing something special when you start controlling it that much. I feel like it, yeah. it loses some of its enjoyment and yeah. Beaver, Sleater's Lake, like seeing all these places go. But then I also find myself saying like, well, at least it's not like Manassas where they just basically lock the key. Yeah. Say, lock you you in. yeah there, there are some fish in, Manassas. I mean, who knows when they're ever going to let that place open? But you know, I'll, I'll golf at you know Stonewall Golf Course, and I'm, I'm looking out at the lake, and th there's not a soul out there. It's and sad. <laughs> it is sad. I mean, uh, one of these days, you know, I, I know Mike's trying to, my, you know, Mike Ortega of NBKBA is, you know, pushing hard to maybe get a private tournament there. That'd be cool if we can do that. But you can make, I mean, I, I don't understand. I get it. Like with these, these, with these homeowner associations, these golf courses that come in. Um, and this is honestly a side note. So I am working now. This is a uh, knock on wood. I'm getting the people that run army Corps engineers that run Kerr and Gaston on the show to talk about lake building. I am trying guys to get Lake Mooney and Hunter run. I'm trying to get oh, the wow. same people on that because I feel like if we want to get new lakes built, it's going to come down to a combination of the state and homeowners associations because the value of land goes up when they're around lakes. And mm -hmm. so if we could figure out a way to put in these small reservoirs, but you get a, a public boat ramp, like hunting run or something like that. I think that's the only way you're going to get new lakes built because yeah. we need them desperately. We really do. And if you look at Northern Virginia, the Percival area, we could really use a couple more small lakes like that. And it would be perfect along the Shenandoah where you could just fill the lake up with the river mm. and then you have access for everybody. It's a win-win. And what's this reservoir, the, the, the Lunga Reservoir that, that's, that just opened up this weekend? I never mm -hmm. heard of it. I mean, that, apparently that was... That was a big deal. It just crossed my radar this weekend. And so yeah. I'm trying to like look into that too. But yeah, like that's awesome. And we need yeah. more of that. Um, 
because it's, I think it's going to really help with the pressure situation. And, and I, I have a hypothesis on that, that if you have one big lake or you have three or four small ones in an area, the three or four small lakes will disperse the pressure more because if generally speaking, if you have a wife and kids, you're not going to just move from lake to lake. You're going to pick one. And right. so it's going to disperse it. But if you have one big one, people will, will move all over it. Yeah. And last year I got to fish hunting, run and Mooney for the first time. And in the same weekend, one lake was busier than the other. Mm -hmm. So it does seem to spread people out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Th those lakes are awesome. I mean, I, I think it's awesome in the way they have a limited opening and they close it in the winter time. I think mean, that, that would be perfect if, if they can do something like that for uh, even for Beaver Dam, but yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a zoo there eventually. It'll be a zoo and, but it'll be nice. Like it'll be like deep Creek Lake, honestly, or Lake Anna where it's like early in the year and late in the year, it'll be good as long as they keep it open for us. Right. For sure. yeah, I, because think, I think they close, I mean, they, they would, when, when it was open, it was open in March and actually they closed it in late October, I think. Um, which is weird because who is going to be out there boarding in October, November? Like right. it, it, the people that are going to be out there are you and me who bring the right safety gear right. for the weather. We're not the ones that are the problem. It's the people in July and right. August. They're the ones that are going to get into trouble. Yep. Now, are you going to be fishing the rest of the NVKVA events this year? Yeah, I got, well, I can fish. Um, I can't fish the last one, which, which is the battle of the five lakes. I think. That's going to be, you know, Mooney, Hunting Run, Nye. That that event, I, I'm going to be out of town. But yeah, I plan on fishing uh, the next one, which is the uh, the Five Lakes, which included Beaver Dam, which uh, is not going to be part of the the choices. But I'll probably fish the Res, uh, and then the one after that is going to be the Rappahannock, which I've never fished. That's going to be interesting. Uh, I think it's the title Rappahannock, That's, and uh, so I'm going to have to hit that a couple times to to learn where to go. So what is your approach to the res? Like, are, are you purely a, you know, the affectionate label of a river rat? And then the res, does that feel like the moon to you? Or is that a place that you're comfortable and have experience? I have not had much success there. <laughs> it's, it's, a. I mean, I know there are big fish in there. I, I can't figure it out. I'm not a big, I think you have to fish the deeper water, which I'm not, I'm not a good deep water fisherman. And, and I've got my, you know, my, Lawrence, uh, I just got to make sure I figure out, you know, where the fish are. Um, I think it's slower fishing, which I'm not accustomed to. And I'm not a big crankbait fisherman, to be honest. And I think it's a lot of crankbait. Really? Yeah, I, I just, I used to be when, with, you know, with, when I was fishing for smallmouth, but um, I just like fishing with like the single hook baits. I, li I like fishing spinner baits, chatter baits, swim jigs, um, my, my fluke um and anything with treble hooks i think it's because i got hooked one time you know yeah, and i was like you know what i'm not gonna do too many hooks i mean i'm not i don't pay attention enough as it is and uh i got hooked <laughs> actually funny story i was at burke lake uh and this and with a buddy who was learning how to fish a bait caster and i'm in the middle of, of a of this john boat at burke lake and my buddy does a sidewind cast. He has a zero spook. Uh, hits me in the face with the spook. I get stunned for like a second, and proceeds to you know backlash is real. Look, firstly, it didn't pull my my face. So I had a, a five inch zero spook on my that went through my cheek, and the most embarrassing thing was I had to go back to the shoreline with this bait in my face. With this is a Saturday, with people looking at me, it was so embarrassing, but. Uh, uh, my buddy of mine had had pliers. He snapped the the the, the hook and ran it through. And yeah, uh, I think from that point on, it I just like you know what I'm not going to fish for trouble boat <laughs> trouble hooks anymore. It's also a rude awakening going from a boat, which is me, and that's how I fish my tournaments, to a kayak and realizing when you're throwing trebs, there's only one place that fish is going. It's in your crotch area. Yeah. And I remember last year I was fishing the Shenandoah and I got on a thing and I'm fishing chartreuse crankbaits. And I had that issue where it was like, okay, I either boat flip them. And then I got two tro car triple grips flopping around, or I forced the net job because mm -hmm. it's probably safer. And because I think the one thing I like about a treble hook is the fact that when they hit that thing, they're going to, they're going to get some kind of hook in them. Yeah. 
because a lot of times when I fish a chatterbait, not always, but it feels like they push it sometimes. They don't eat it. Yep. Right. Um, but yeah, th those treble hooks in a kayak, dude. Oof, man, that does not mix well. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and, and the last thing really is the tidal Potomac then. Like, what are your thoughts on that specifically and your skill set um, just throughout the years? Yeah, you know, I, again, the tidal Potomac, it was, uh, I'm still learning. You know, I, I, I stunk it up, you know, the, the trail event last month. I went to Matter Woman um, and they just weren't hitting there. And the second day I had my kayak in the, in the river. Uh, I heard the thunder and lightning. I just <laughs> turned around and packed my car back. And I didn't, I didn't fish the second day. Um, it was, it was very short lived. The thunder, I, I could have stayed, but, um, whenever it's lightning, I'm just like, I'm nervous. I, I don't want to be on the water, but, um, I'm still learning. I mean, I, I'm tomorrow. I'm going to go fish. I think, uh, my buddy has a boat. Uh, we're going to hit Poic. Uh, he's been catching a lot, you know, I guess the grass is growing there right now um but you know so when i fished the potomac back in the day I, it was mainly above woodwell wilson bridge so my buddy and i would go to fort the fort mcnair wall um we, uh, that place was awesome um i don't think you're i think the now that like they'll tell like they'll tell people to get up away from the wall there um uh, the military people there but um so the washington i think it's called the washington channel and then the hydrilla used to be used to grow, you know, the spoils area right below the bridge. We'd be in the middle of the river below Wilson Bridge, and so it's it's a flat. It, the, the water there is like three feet deep. But um, fishing topwater frogs, uh, and now the grass just doesn't grow. I, I'm not sure if the the carp are eat, eating it or if they if they put chemical down. But it's it's there's no grass at all in that area even Bellhaven used to three years ago Bellhaven had pretty nice grass or four years ago uh past three years nothing the biggest thing I hope people will learn if they pick anything up from listening to this show is the importance of subaquatic vegetation SAV yep. grass it's not a weed and I remember you know the same story I told a couple of times where somebody was off his dock dumping pesticides he had to kill the grass around his dock and you don't truly appreciate like how important it is. It's like going out into the woods and just burning down the forest because you don't like the view. It, you need that stuff. It's a, it's a natural habitat for an ecosystem. It's not a swimming pool. Right. And whether it's the Potomac river or Lake Gannett or the TVA system of lakes, you know, I was reading some articles this past week about how um, Lake Chickamauga has a huge issue because homeowners are spraying too much of the aquatic vegetation. And mm -hmm. If you do that, you kill the ecosystem. You need grass. It's important for the environment. And hopefully, if through proper teaching and education, people will learn because whether it was construction of the bridge or um, I had Captain Steve Chaconis on about a month ago, and he talked about this huge restoration project where we built that retaining wall. And ever since that happened, whatever it was, all the vegetation in the upper part, it's dead. It's gone. And yeah, it's not. Actually, it's Steve... I went on a guided, well, my buddy got me a guided trip with Steve and this was 2018 and we launched off, we launched out of Bellhaven and there was grass everywhere when we fished. And since that time, uh, it hasn't grown back. Um, but you know, prior to, you know, meeting Steve, um, uh, my buddy we would fish again above Woodrow Wilson bridge, the spoils and the middle of the river is where we would actually catch fish. Uh, I mean, right below the bridge and it was full of hydrilla. Um, it was awesome. Has there always been vegetation on the upper Potomac where you fish or is that cyclical? It's cyclical. I think it's, it's cyclical. I think it seems like every other year it grows. It grew last year. Um, but I noticed patches of it growing this year too. So I'm not sure if that's remnants from last year or not, but, um, it's definitely cyclical. Do, do you see any kind of correlation with like the quality of the fishery? Like, if the grass is there, is the fishing better or do you, is it, it's, it's, it's a lot better. <laughs> it's a lot better. Um, yeah. The, the, when the water, uh, with the grass and it's, it's, it's more fun too, cause it's, it, you can, you know, the bass are just underneath that in the summertime in the middle of the river and you can just cast anywhere basically and they'll, you'll get a hit. The last thing for tonight. And, and yeah, thank you so much for coming on this show is, you keep kicking people's butts there. And what's crazy is 
no one fishes the upper Potomac. And, and, and even when I have Jeff Green on the show and talk about his guide service, people are just now figuring out that the upper Potomac is it. I guess my question is, why is that? Is it because it's so close to big cities that no one thinks there's fish there? Like, how does it fly under the radar for so long? Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I asked Mike Ortega, you know, the tournament, you know, how, how many of the top 10 from the tournament fish the Potomac? And I thought at least two or three of us would fish it. But he said I was the only one. Everybody, the, the other nine anglers uh, fish the Shenandoah. And I think it's because it, it's not an easy place to fish. Um you know, I have the, the benefit of a Torquedo and the benefit of just knowing where to go with my Torquedo. Um, if anybody else had a Torquedo and they said, well, I can do that too, they would they would hit rocks and boulders and they'd get, you know, they'd probably be frustrated. So I have a, <laughs> I take the same path and it's a path that I learned that my Torquedo can handle. And I'll hit a couple of boulders, but, you know, I've got the rock guard on it and um, it's just not easy to fish because you're, it's moving water. And if you, if I was in a kayak, Without my torpedo, uh, I would probably turn around and go home. I wouldn't. I wouldn't bother. It's just. It's a hard. It's a hard paddle. Um, so, I think that uh, is the main reason is that people don't. Unless, if you float down from Algonquin to where I am, um, it, it's easier, obviously. But I, I'm. I'm not a big. I don't like floating for smallmouth. Mm -hmm. I like you know just smallmouth. They're always facing up river. And I want to, I want to be behind them. I don't want to be in front of them. That is big because I think that ruins a lot of people when you smallmouth fish. And this is why a jet boat is kind of nice too, because just being precise, you want to go up river. You want to go up river. And I think when you're floating, you get impatient. So you see a spot and you'll hit it, but it, it, you got to wait till you pass it and, you know, cast when, when you're, when you're behind the spot, not in front of it. And I think people just, you know, when, when, when you're floating, you just, you know, you get, you lose your concentration. But if I, if I'm, when I float down, you know, when I go up river, my torpedo, I hit my spots. When I go back down, I wait to hit my spots till, till I pass the spot I want to fish. I don't cast, you know, into a, into a, a ripple. I want to make sure I attack the entire uh, area that that fish is in. in. In a tournament, you're only needing five bites. And so, I think this is also something that can hurt people sometimes is they try to float a massive section for eight hours or what have you. You need five and smallmouth. Like when I fished last year, you know, the area I was in, I fished a small section because I knew it, it had them mm -hmm. and I didn't need to float 10 miles. I just needed one mile that had five good ones. Is that kind of your same thought process too in tournaments? It's like, I don't need a ginormous section. I just need the right area at the right time. Yeah. So, so I've got, maybe 50 spots that I want to hit when I, when I fish. And I know I'm going to hit at least five fish in one, in one of those 50 spots. So during the tournament, you know, I didn't, I only had at 12, like 11, 4, 11 30, I had two fish. Uh, and I'd, I, I'd hit all my spots, but I think the timing was a little off. So um, I hit my big fish at 12 o'clock. It was a 19 and 19 and a quarter, you know, 19 and a half, I think, small mouth. And, um, when that after that fish hit, the, the bite was 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 awesome. And yeah, I I just yeah, you just gotta hit, you know, the, the big small mouth, they they always take the best spots in the river. Mm -hmm. it, it I mean it's just you know, the, if there's a small fish in the a bigger small mouth is gonna chase it out and it's gonna sit there. Um so it, it's pretty predictable how I fish and where I fish. How long do you give a spot? Uh, I'm sorry. How long do you like to give a spot? Like, so if you fit, let's just say it's 50 like or 30 fast, spots. Fast. Three or four, four casts. I mean, a, a small okay. mouth, if you don't, if you hit, well, I think the time of the year, if you make a cast, three or four casts, and you don't have a have a hit, I don't think there's a fish in it. I mean, that's Do you I'm ever at. throw a tube or a Ned rig? I don't see you just stopping to throw something slow. <laughs> I, well, I mean, again, my my torpedo, I can I can idle my torpedo in current, uh -huh. so I can stay. I don't have to put my anchor down. Um, I can make three or four casts in a spot, and if I don't get a hit, I'm 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 out of it. And um, but uh, I don't like. It's funny you ask about tubes. I don't like because if a if a if a smallmouth you know takes a tube and, and destroys the tube, I got to retie that hook. 
that's a pain in the butt. So that's why I started using uh, the Hula Grub, which I think is just, and, you know, Ned Rigs are, you know, I think they're the same profile. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and plus I get too hung up with the tube where, you know, it's, it's pretty rocky bottom. I like fishing in the middle of the column or on top um, where it's a fast retrieve. I'm not getting hung up. If I, if I fish a, uh, you know, when I have to fish slower in the summertime, when, when the water's a little clearer, um, the, uh, you get hung up and that irritates me. I don't like it. <laughs> hmm. No, that, that, that's really good information because it also is time of year. Exactly. Cause yeah. like, I mean, I know that Jeff little, he'll spend about six hours in one spot dragging a little jig, but he's usually doing that in very cold water versus yeah. which comes down to the age old thing. If you don't have to fish slow, don't. You right. Know, yeah. In the water. wintertime, I think, you know, there, there, there are definitely pools. Um, there's a, there's a pool that I found in the, so sometimes I'll, I'll fish late November or early February. And, and I found this one pool that had like five decent large, small mouth in it. Uh, and I fished slow, you know, only because it was what it was called for. But otherwise, um, you know, I've got a swim bait or a chatter bait. If you had to pick one place this year that you get to fish river wise, it's not the river Potomac. What would it be? We'll finish off with that. The Holston river. Ooh. So my tournament, you know, it, it was only, it was only for, uh, the, the only legal fishing areas were the Potomac, Rappahannock. It was any river that ran through the state of Virginia. So the James was in play. Um, but we didn't have any fish, uh, anglers that, in that area. Most of it were Shenandoah and Potomac. And then I'm, I met a bunch of guys that were, uh, Actually, a bunch of guys that were uh, asked about fishing the, the, my league, and I said sure. And I asked them where they lived, and they said they lived in in the Tennessee Virginia border, and they fished the North Holston River. Uh, so these two guys, uh, Scott Perkins and uh, Randall Combs, they're really nice. I haven't met them personally, but really nice guys. Uh, the the first year that they entered the tournament, they had in their five you know five fish bags that we had they would have at least three 20 inch smallmouth in their bag and they, they crushed the, I mean, it was not even a competition. I'm like, we can't compete. You know, what is this river? And if you look on the map, the North Holston, it's about the width of a road, uh, like a, <laughs> it's pretty narrow. And so the history of the North Holston is that uh, years ago they had a, a mercury uh, leak from a munitions post or something so you can't, you're not allowed to eat any, or they warn you not to eat any fish out of the Holston. Um, but that place is the, is a, like a smallmouth haven. Um, these guys regularly catch 20 inch smallmouth and it's the North, there, there is a North and the South Holston river. So this is the South Holston Lake. Yeah. This is Virginia. So I'm assuming it dumps in. So this must be it right here. Yeah, if you look at the map, it it it's it it kind of reminds me of the Shenandoah. It's very small, um, but wow, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that that place has got some big fish. South Fork, yeah, this is the North right here. That's the yeah. It it you can tell just by how much it it snakes on itself. It looks a lot like the North and South Fork. Yep, dude, that would be that would be a fun trip. That would yeah. be a lot of fun. Yeah, so actually this guy, Scott Perkins, I think he does guided trips. If you look on Facebook, um, real nice guy. I think he does trips in the summertime. But if you want to catch some big smallmouth, uh, get a hold of him. And he might be the next guest on the show. I'm yeah, I can, I, can, I can introduce. He, he actually spoke uh, with, the small, with the Potomac River Smallmouth Club and uh, presented you know, the river. But, it, yeah, I mean, 20 inches it was like – they don't even laugh. They just like, yeah, we caught a 20 incher. <laughs> I think the, 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 they had a couple guys had, uh, and the, so there's a, there's another smallmouth league. Uh, I think it's called Yakers for Smallies. And if you look at their leader, they do stuff on turning eggs. And three of the, the top five guys had a hundred inches over a hundred inch smallmouth. It's a smallmouth only league. And a couple of those guys fished the new river. But I know one of the guys, he fishes the Holston, and he had a fish that was 22 and a half, I think. Good <laughs> Lord, man. Yeah. 
those rivers are old. I just, and by the time this episode drops, um, I had a fantastic conversation about the new river with two guides down there. Dude, those rivers, that the whole city, they're dinosaurs. They are yeah. old. They are old. It's hard to get to. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I mean, I can't imagine when you went there without, I, for my 16th birthday, I stayed up money. So I was able to go down there and do a float trip. And I think it was, it was below Clear Lake Dam, I think it was. But you're down there and dude, it is, you're on another planet. There's yeah. nothing around. It is not like fishing the upper Potomac guys where you have major cities on each side. No, no, no. This is yeah. Jurassic Park. And the yes, fish are it definitely is Jurassic Park. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, sir, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Is there anything uh, in particular that you would like to plug or, or, or anything you have going on? No, just, uh, you know, NBKBA, you know, that's a great group of guys. If, you know, if you want to kayak, you know, tar- fishing tournaments of the great uh, Mike Ortega runs a great uh, league. I think it's their fourth or fifth year um but uh no just uh enjoy your show you do a great job too so keep it up thank you so much i appreciate it and again guys link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today uh please give us a like on youtube it really helps us in the algorithm or you can download us on spotify apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. we are basically everywhere you google us you can find us and you can listen to us we are fishing in dmv we are the number one fishing show in the greater dmv metropolitan area we'll see you next time you're listening Bye. to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.